Okay, everybody. So um, we're actually at the point now where we can delve into uh, the text that uh, we read from Hannah Arendt. Um, and I've tried to provide basically the historical background for um, a text which I know uh, is relatively difficult because uh, it's covering so much historical material, which uh, I'm sure uh, is not something that all of you necessarily um, know about or uh, have studied very, very closely. But everything that we've talked about thus far is going to actually help us understand um, what Arendt means when she focuses on the groups, the minorities, and the stateless, and why she makes the argument that their situation uh, essentially encompasses the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man. To really understand that, as I've been trying to make the argument thus far, you have to understand how the nature of identity actually shifted over the course of the 19th century. How the idea of nationality and national identity uh, as something that was based on the rights and obligations of citizenship and assimilation into the people uh, and the people's ruling itself on the basis of its freedom and its right essentially to national sovereignty, how that conception of national identity, which again was one really focused on integration, on the rights and obligations of citizenship, how that shifts by the end of the 19th century to an idea of national identity which is really focused on um, ethnicity and on race and who are the right kind of people and who are the wrong kind of people in our society. And so focus essentially on making sure that the wrong kind of people are not actually in our society. So again, the situation of the Jews being integrated on the basis of citizenship and then by the end of the 19th century, increasingly being thought by many as outsiders in Europe because uh, being racially different from everybody else uh, of their respective nations in, in the European continent. Um, and like I said, that is the background, uh, this background of imperial rivalry, of national rivalry, um, for the breakout of the First World War. Um, and that is basically where Hannah Arendt picks up the story. Uh, she picks up the story in the chapter that we read from her on the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man, essentially right after the end of the First World War, um, where she argues no normality came back, essentially, after the end of this war. Um, and the argument that she wants to make is that actually the aftermath of the war seem, simply made clear all of the ways in which the ideal of the nation state as based on citizenship and on human rights in a way had already started to break down. And it's that breakdown that had even made the World War possible, or was the World War I called the Great War possible in the first place, and its full ramifications, she wants to argue, actually become fully clear uh, after the First World War. And we see those full ramifications in the situation of the two groups of people that she focuses on, the minorities and the stateless. We want to understand who are these people? Who is she talking about here? Who are the minorities? What did they have to do with what Arendt calls the decline of the nation state? 
this is a map of Europe in 1914, so on the eve of World War I. If you look at this map, you'll see there are a group of nation states. There's the United Kingdom, there's Spain, there's Portugal, there's France, there, there's, there's the German Empire, um, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, Italy, and a number of new nation states in Eastern Europe that have been carved out of uh, the Ottoman Empire. But you also have this still these very, very large multinational dynastic empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Who lives in the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Um, there are more than 11 nationalities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, there are obviously the Austrians who are actually ethnically German, um, and there are the Hungarians. Uh, those are the two largest nationalities, hence the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We'll talk about why it's called that. Um, but then there are a host of others, the people called the South Slavs, the Southern Slavs, so Serbians, who are not only the Serbian kingdom, but Serbians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Croatians, uh, Slovenians, um, Bosnians, um, there are uh, Italians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, large number of Poles in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, people called Ruthenians, which is how Ukrainians were referred to in the 19th uh, century. Um, there are many, many Poles uh, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There are Czechs, there are Slovaks, right? Uh, many, many different national groups. In the Russian Empire, you have many different Slavic groups, not just Russians, but Ukrainians, Poles, um, Lithuanians, uh, Latvians, Estonians, all of the different ethnicities in Central Asia. Um, in the Ottoman Empire, also many different nationalities. Uh, we usually refer to it as Ottoman uh, Turkey, so there were Turks, but uh, many, many Greeks, Armenians, uh, the vast majority of Arabs uh, lived in the Ottoman Empire. So there are still these dynastic multinational empires, and there are these nation states like Germany and France and Spain that have at least had a number of generations to integrate people into this common national identity. Remember I said uh, all of these identities actually are constructed and composite identities. We have a sense of this to this day, right? There are people in Spain who say, uh, I'm not Spanish, I'm Catalan, or I'm Basque, right? Which just shows you that these are composite, composite constructed identities. And if you put enough pressure, actually, on any nation state, uh, it can start to fragment. Um, but there's been generations in which a common national identity has been created in these nation states. Uh, a number of them, like France, you see, have globalized themselves, French Morocco, French Algeria, French uh, Tunisia. And on the other hand, we have uh, these multinational empires, these dynastic empires still. I remember I said that's part of the background besides the fact of the imperial rivalry between Britain and Germany, uh, there is the situation of these multinational empires which are dealing with the problem of how do you get people actually to identify with the country uh, because that's actually where power in the modern world comes from and you have all of these different people. That's why the Austrian Empire becomes the Austro-Hungarian Empire because the idea is, well, let's at least take the two biggest nationalities um, and uh, 
make the empire uh, acknowledge at least these two, um, despite the fact that there's so many others. In the Russian empire, there's an attempt to create, to make all of the different groups uh, somehow identify themselves as Russian. Um, in the Ottoman empire, their attempts to create a kind of Ottoman identity for all of the different national groups, right? All of them are struggling with this problem of uh, how do we make ourselves over in the image of a nation? So how do we get people actually to identify with the country? Uh, because that's the basis essentially of power uh, in uh, the modern world, that you can mobilize all of the people of uh, a territory. So that is the context. And it's all of those rivalries between those nationalities, between Serbia outside uh, and uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the different Slavic groups. This is the context which uh, allows for the breakout of World War I, aside from the problem of imperialism and of globalizing imperial nation states, which, you know, there have been, so far, there's only been one time in which a global hegemon has been taken over economically. That was the British Empire being taken over by Germany and the United States industrially and economically by the First World War. And the result of it were massive world wars. And we're living in the second time only in human history where that is happening, where the United States in the next decades would almost certainly be taken over economically by China. Um, and everybody's very worried precisely because of what the experience was the last time that something like this happened. But this is the problem then. This is the situation before World War I. Uh, and what happens after World War I? Look at the map after World War I. You see what's happened? All of the multinational empires, the Russian, the Ottoman, the Austro-Hungarian, they collapse in the First World War. So all of those multinational dynastic empires that in a sense we started talking about when we were talking about European history and the shift towards the nation state, uh, they had been bureaucratic, dynastic, administrative states focused uh, really about uh, the reason of state and ex expanding their territory as much as possible. But since they don't actually have the capacity to remake themselves in the image of the nation, all of them break down in the context of the crisis of the First World War. The Ottoman Empire becomes the Turkish nation state, um, and all of the other areas are actually taken over by the imperial powers, by Britain and France. Uh, and uh, they're turned into what are called mandates, uh, which is basically a, a kind of using the language of nationality to allow for the continuation of empire. Since what were supposed to be created after the First World War are a world of nation states. Um, and all of these are supposed to be nation states here, essentially, except for the Soviet Union that we'll come to. Um, the idea was, uh, okay, we've created a League of Nations. How do we, how, how can we still continue basically to continue the imperial game uh, and take over these areas that had been part of uh, the Ottoman Empire. Well, um, we'll give a mandate to the British and the French to prepare these people under their mandate to civilize them and make them ready for self-determination and self-rule, right? So the idea of self-rule and self -de national self-determination is used as a way of actually continuing uh, empire. But you see, now the only legitimate language in some ways is the language of the nation state. The Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, which collapses and is defeated by Germany before the Germans are actually defeated by uh, the Allies, by the French uh, and the British and uh, the Americans who come into the war in 1916. Uh, the 
Russian Empire collapses, undergoes the Russian Revolution, Communist Revolution, um, and is recreated as a Soviet of socialist republics. Each of the socialist republics are, in a way, national uh, republics, but they're nation. This is a union of national socialist uh, republics, and then you have this attempt to create nation states in Eastern Europe. So if you looked uh, at the previous map and you compare it with this map after, there was no Poland. Now you see a gigantic uh, Poland. Um, you see these uh, states that had been taken over by Germany from Russia, but they become independent, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Um, you have... Czechoslovakia, uh, Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, right? Uh, so the map of Europe is remade in the image increasingly of nation state. And that was the whole plan after the First World War with the American president, Woodrow Wilson, saying, uh, that if we want to prevent another war, what we need is national self-determination. And we need to come up with a League of Nations, the predecessor to the United Nations, to make sure that we actually create um, that unity of peoples who rule themselves and protect essentially each other from aggressive uh, um, imperial takeover, right? Um, so if you just look at this map, you would think, well, that story of how the nation state is supposed to make human rights a reality for everybody by giving each people the right to rule themselves and through citizenship making rights a reality for everybody, that seems to be coming true, right? Um, we have it here in Europe. Eventually, with growing decolonization after the Second World War, we have it for the whole world. But this is exactly the situation in which Arendt talks about what happens after the First World War shows us that there was a decline of the nation state. Um, so what does she mean by that? Uh, the way that she tries to make that argument and make sense of it is to talk about the minorities. Uh, one of the things you have to think about when you go back into this pre-1914 world with these multinational empires, with all of these different nationalities, is they're all mixed up with each other, right? It's not like they're in separate areas within the empire. Uh, these peoples are very, very mixed up in these imperial contexts. And... When these new states are created, uh, they include massive numbers of ethnic and national minorities within each of the new nation states that is actually created. Um, and these are the minorities that she is talking about. So, for example, in Czechoslovakia, which is itself a composite uh, nationality, right? Of the Czech nation and of the Slovak nation. Um, Czechoslovakia, after the First World War, had something like uh, 14 million, a little more than 14 uh, million people. And the Czechs are a little more than half of the people in Czechoslovakia. And they are definitely the dominant national group in Czechoslovakia. Who's the second ethnic national group in Czechoslovakia? It's not the Slovaks, right? Uh, the second largest ethnic national group in Czechoslovakia are the Germans. They are in the Sudetenland, which is uh, this area right where you see Czechoslovakia starts, right? 
That area is called, between Germany and Czechoslovakia, that area is called the Sudetenland, and it has more than 3.3 million Germans who live in Czechoslovakia, right? And the Slovaks are about 3 million people in Czechoslovakia. So there are more Germans than Slovaks in Czechoslovakia. And this is not only the situation in Czechoslovakia. Everywhere, there are very, very large numbers of different nationalities. In Yugoslavia, the dominant group are the Serbs, but they're less than half of the people, including the Croats and the Bosnians um, uh, and uh, uh, the Slovenes and all of the different groups. In Poland, the Polish are just around 60% of the population in Poland, which includes so many Germans and Jews and, right? Uh, all of these nation states have massive numbers of minorities. Uh, and now we're in a world in which, remember, nationality and national identity has increasingly come to be defined in ethnic exclusive racial terms. So if you are a a Czech or even a Slovak in Czechoslovakia and you're living with all of these Germans uh, in your country, do you see these people, now that nationality has increasingly come to be seen not as something about assimilation and citizenship, but increasingly about uh, ethnicity and exclusivity and race, do you see all of these Germans who are living with you as fellow citizens, people who will eventually come to identify with Czechoslovakia, or do you see them as potential enemies behind the line, right next to Germany? And that's in fact exactly what happens when the Nazis come to power in Germany, right? In 1938, Germany takes over, Hitler takes over the Sudetenland, and he says, this is not Czechoslovakia, this is Germany. These are all Germans, right? Uh, and in fact, the other powers, the British and the French, appease. It's called, this is the great moment of appeasement. They appease Hitler. They say, well, I mean, he's kind of right. Look, they're all Germans, right? And this is a world in which all of these new nation states that have been created, they're all fighting with each other. They hadn't existed before. They're fighting with each other over population, over territory. So they have so many people from the different nationalities within their own country. And they're bound generally to look at those people not as fellow citizens, but as potential enemies in some ways, right? Uh, just because, you know, you were in the Austro-Hungarian Empire... And the next day you wake up and you're a German and you find yourself in Czechoslovakia, right? So how to deal with this situation? So what the League of Nations does is he for they force all of these new nation states in Eastern Europe to sign what are called minority treaties, right? Saying, okay, we'll accept... Uh, that you are a legitimate nation state, but you actually have to promise to protect your minorities and accept that they have special rights, like um, they have. you have to make sure that you don't force them, for example, to give up their language um, or their customs and their traditions, for example, right? Um, and uh, these are when Arendt talks about the minorities. She's talking essentially about this world in which um, you have all of these nation states, but then you increasingly have large numbers of people within those nation states uh, who are somehow the wrong kind of people in that nation state. They're not fellow citizens. Uh, they're minorities that need some kind of a special protection by an international organization, the League of Nations.
Now think about this. Is this a bad idea? The idea of, well, we have these minorities, we have to make sure that uh, they're protected. Um, since they're not quite seen as being fellow citizens in the country, we need to make sure that they have at least enough protection um, that maybe hopefully over time they'll actually come to identify um, with these states. Uh, but this is where Hannah Arendt stops and says, look, once you get this new reality, once you actually get the idea of minority rights that are backed by an international organization, this is the moment when you know that the nation state doesn't quite exist because the nation state was based on the idea of equality of citizenship. And that the rights of man, in a way, have already also come to an end, right? Why? Think about it. The whole idea of nationality as based on citizenship and based on human rights was the idea that people, by having their own government, right, will be able to make human rights a reality for their own people. And that people would be a part of that nationality through the rights and obligations of citizenship. But now, here you have an international organization coming and telling people, telling states, look, you have to protect uh, these people who are part of your country. Um, because it cannot be taken for granted through their mere citizenship in that country. But then that just shows you that identity is no longer based on citizenship. Nationality is no longer about citizenship, right? And if it's no longer about citizenship, then it certainly can't be based on the idea of the common rights and obligations uh, that are given to us by our common humanity. So this is the sense in which the very need for minority rights for Arendt shows that we've actually moved beyond a situation in which human rights actually can be considered the basis of identity and of belonging, since it's really now defined by race and by ethnicity and really focused on um, who are the right kind of people in our society and who are the wrong kind of people in our society. And this is the sense in which Arendt argues after the First World War, you start to get the shift not only from the nation state to the imperial nation state, which already first started to make those kinds of exclusivist decisions about who belongs and who does not belong, but that increasingly we move from the nation state to the ideological state. The ideological state decides essentially on an ideological basis who are the right people and who are the wrong people who belongs, who can be a part of the state, and who is an enemy on an ideological basis of the people and must be thrown out. So in the Soviet Union, that ideology comes to be Marxist communism and the idea that this is a state that belongs to the workers. You're not one of the workers, you have no business being in the Soviet Union. Um, you can be denationalized. And in fact, so many people in the civil war that breaks out in uh, the context of the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, uh, and after that, there's essentially a war uh, where the Bolsheviks consolidate their power. In the midst of that war, more than a million and a half Russians are essentially denationalized. They lose their citizenship, right? Uh, remember, before the focus was on integrating and assimilating everybody into the nation through citizenship. 
now the focus is we have to get rid of the people who are the wrong kind of people from an ideological perspective. In a worker state, the bourgeoisie, the property, these are the wrong kind of people. They're the enemies. They have to be thrown out. That's how you get people who lose their citizenship altogether. They lose their nationality. Um, they're essentially expelled from their societies. In what becomes Nazi Germany, uh, only people of Aryan race are seen as actually being part of the German people. So that means anybody who's not a member of the Aryan race, Jews particularly, Roma, um, they can be, they are first made into second class citizens and uh, then they can become fundamentally stateless, right? Once you actually get this dynamic where a group of people are seen as not being the same citizens as everybody else, including the minorities in Eastern Europe, right? As being, in a sense, the wrong kind of people who might need special protection, in fact, that way of separating them out from the rest of the society becomes the way in which many of them are then thrown out of those societies. Uh, and so they become stateless, right? So these are the group of people that Arendt is especially focused on in this chapter on the decline of the nation state and the end of the rights of man. And she herself was one of these people. She herself uh, becomes a stateless refugee. She escapes to France. She's then in a concentration camp uh, in France. Um, and then she escapes in the, in the Second World War. And then she escapes and uh, comes to the United States. And after a long period of time, she becomes an American citizen. But she's essentially one of these stateless refugees that... Uh, she herself is talking about uh, in this chapter. And she uses the situation of the stateless and of the minorities not only to talk about the decline of the nation state, right? Uh, the decline of a state actually based on citizenship. Uh, for her, uh, the situation of the stateless specifically makes clear the problem of uh, the very idea that we have rights on the basis of our humanity, the very idea of universal human rights. She wants to argue there's actually something very dangerous about this idea. Um, something that doesn't quite understand how rights actually work, how rights are actually based on identity and belonging and not fundamentally on our shared humanity. To make this case, she compares the situation of the stateless and the criminals. All of these masses of people who, remember, before the focus was on integration, now, uh, especially what she calls totalitarian governments, basically uh, expel and take away the citizenship of masses of their own citizens. But she says, you know, this is not just, for example, the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. Uh, all the countries in Europe pass denationalization laws. All of the countries in Europe become focused on this idea of uh, we have to make sure that we have the right people here and to get rid of the wrong kind of people. So you get masses of refugees all around Europe. Um, so many Spanish people, for example, Armenians uh, who are denationalized uh, uh, by the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Russians, uh, eventually all of the Jews who um, um, lose their uh, citizenship in, uh, uh, in Nazi Germany, right? You have all of these masses of uh, stateless people, um, and she compares their situation to criminals. And I want to read to you 
the part of the text where she does that because I think it'll really get to the heart of her argument about what's wrong with this idea of universal human rights. The idea that human right, universal human rights are the basis actually of legitimate political authority in society. And this is the uh, last paragraph on page 286. If you want, you can uh, stop and go get the text uh, and I'm gonna read it to you. So she says, the best criterion by which to decide whether someone has been forced outside the pale of the law is to ask if he would benefit by committing a crime. If a small burglary is likely to improve his legal position, at least temporarily, one may be sure he has been deprived of human rights. For then a criminal offense becomes the best opportunity to regain some kind of human equality, even if it be as a recognized exception to the norm. The one important fact is that this exception is provided for by law. As a criminal, even a stateless person will not be treated worse than another criminal. That is, he will be treated like everybody else. Only as an offender against the law can he gain protection from it. As long as his trial and his sentence lasts, he will be safe from that arbitrary police rule against which there are no lawyers and no appeals. The same man who was in jail yesterday because of, the me of his mere presence in this world, who had no rights whatever and lived under threat of deportation, or who was dispatched without sentence and without trial to some kind of internment because he had tried to work and make a living, may become almost a full-fledged citizen because of a little theft. Even if he is penniless, he cannot get a lawyer, complain about his jailers, and he will be listened to respectfully. He is no longer the scum of the earth, but important enough to be informed of all the details of the law under which he will be tried. He has become a respectable person. Think about that. Why is the situation of the stateless person worse than the situation of the criminal according to Arendt? Well, the stateless person, by actually committing a crime, becomes like a citizen. They become actually part of the community in the sense that they are actually judged for their action. They can actually become responsible for their action, and on that basis, they actually exercise rights. Whereas, what is the situation of the stateless? They are actually simply treated as part of a mass who are ruled outside of society, outside of the law, basically by the police. right? What happens to them has nothing to do with who it is that they are, what their actions are, what their opinions are. It just happened that because they were the wrong group of people in one society and they were thrown out of it, then they're treated like that essentially wherever they end up because they don't belong anywhere. They don't have identity anywhere. They're not part of any community. In fact, if you are a stateless person, then you are bound ultimately to find yourself in some kind of concentration camp, uh, ruled essentially outside of the law by the police. What does this say about the dangers of the idea of basing rights on our humanity? Why does this suggest that human rights actually point more to dehumanization rather than a way of preventing dehumanization? Well, because think about it. Those stateless people who have lost their community, who have lost their identity, who have lost all belonging, who are placed outside of the uh, rule of law and ruled by the police, what do they have left? They have nothing left except 
their humanity. So in fact, the only thing that the stateless have are their human rights. Because remember, that's the idea of universal human rights. We have these rights regardless of whether we're in a community or not, whether we belong, what our identity is, who we are. We have them simply by virtue of being a human person, right? But Arendt argues, if that's what happens to us, if we actually have nothing left, if we don't have community, if we don't have an identity, if we are not recognized by anybody, and all we are are just a human person, then we're actually completely dehumanized. Then we're actually completely rightless. If we're somebody who just has their human rights left, if that's all you have, you're sitting in a concentration camp somewhere. Right? And that's why for her, this is the wrong way of thinking about rights because it doesn't acknowledge where rights actually come from. Arendt's argument is that rights actually come from identity they come from belonging to a community. They come from something that we do. It's not that we have rights simply by being human beings. It's because we undertake some kind of action, meaning political action, right? It's that we do something that we actually recognize each other as equal, as having the same identity, and so as having mutual rights. This is why she says it's actually the reverse. It's not that we're all fundamentally human beings and so we have rights. It's that we're actually all, as individuals, radically different from each other. We do something. We undertake some kind of political action. We create some kind of identity and that's what actually creates rights. So the idea of, for her, what's wrong with the idea of universal human rights is that it doesn't actually recognize that rights come from community. They come from belonging. They come from what we do. For her, each of us is fundamentally a political actor and it's dependent on what we do whether people have rights or don't have rights. Are they integrated in society and belong and so actually have rights? Or are they excluded, marginalized, and so increasingly in a situation like that of the stateless in which their actions and their opinions become meaningless? Where... They can't even have a sense of responsibility because what they do doesn't really matter, right? They're defined as being the wrong kind of people and thrown out of society, right? For her, fundamentally, rights come from the way in which we define human community and human identity. And there's no such thing as human identity. There is identity that we actually create politically together. And each community does that essentially according to Arendt for itself. This is why for Arendt, it's the wrong, it's not really the right kind of question to ask. Um, how do we make human rights real, right? This is the argument that we saw with Kant, who said it's our universal human development that ultimately will lead to human rights becoming something that's a reality for everybody. Or you can say, well, that's so problematic because look at what she showed. She showed that ultimately, um, if there is no state that is going to recognize your rights, then you lose essentially your human rights. Uh, so the, somehow the problem is actually the relationship between rights uh, being dependent on being part of some 
uh, one political community? What if we could create a world uh, state, for example, that could recognize all human beings? Um, then this problem wouldn't essentially happen. But for Arendt, again, this misses the point. The problem is not about, well, you know, these are universal rights and the question is, how do we actually make them real? The real question is, how do we define community? Because it's possible that we could have a universal state supposedly representing all human beings but what if we start to define what it is really to be a human person as belonging to the master race, the way the Nazis did? And according to the Nazis, to truly represent humanity, to truly work towards the perfection of humanity, we have to get rid of all of those people who are an obstacle to the realization of the perfect human being, of the perfect race. And so to realize humanity, we have to get rid of the enemies of the master race, the Jews. Right? You could always create supposedly a society based on humanity, but define humanity in such an exclusive way so that you might have to get rid of some part of humanity to supposedly realize what human beings are actually supposed to be, right? This is why Arendt argues that uh, it's never our human development over time, which very often actually creates winners and losers, um, uh, creates people who uh, um, might be marginalized, uh, and defined as belonging to the past in one way or another, um, that will actually create common equality and rights. What makes that possible is what each of us do. And this is why, uh, you know, for people like Kant and for Marx, politics is the problem. We need to get beyond politics, right, for Kant, ultimately to get to a society of laws based on knowledge. For Marx, we need to get beyond politics, which is simply all about exploitation. And the way we do it by is by having a society that has enough uh, and more than enough for everybody so that we don't need the repres repression of the state anymore. Politics is the problem. Think about our own society. So often, this is the thought process. Politicians are the problem. Politics is the problem. If we could just have the right kind of development, if we could have enough education, if we could have enough knowledge, um, then we'd get to where we want to be as human beings. And Arendt makes a radically different argument. Right? She makes the argument that actually, the only rights that we have, the only identity that we have, comes from undertaking political action, comes from creating community through our action, and by doing that, creating the world in which what people do and what people think actually matters. Because if we're just reduced to being human beings, then it's almost like we're just a member of an animal group, right? Um, and that's the opposite of some, a world that could actually create rights, which are based on belonging and identity. Okay, I'm going to stop here, um, and you'll see how this is connected to her argument about totalitarianism. Um, and uh, this last section should not be very, very long. Um, it should be less than half an hour, I hope.